Dave's podcast, episode 10. Police, tragedy, BMW, surveyor, strikes and getting busy living. It was around this time, early 1985, that I had a short period where I became all career orientated. I guess it was being newly wed and a homeowner. But don't worry, it didn't last for long. With this newfound zest and motivation, I had the bright idea of applying to be an MOD policeman. It had a recognised career structure, was well paid, well, compared to being a storeman, and they looked favourably on taking people who had already undergone a rigorous security check. So I filled in the extensive application form. I had an interview. I was then called for a test. I had to write an essay and do some basic maths. I hadn't really done anything like this for a while, as I had left school nearly 10 years ago. But my basic maths was good. All those years working in shops with no fancy tills had helped. In fact, a few years ago, I went on a stag weekend with my nephew. We ended up at the local pub playing darts. Most of these people were under 30 and no one could add up and subtract. I had to do it all. Young people today. Oh my God, I've become my dad. Back to the police. Having done these tests satisfactorily, I was given a medical and here came a problem. I was 25 and weighed under 10 stone. I was considered a bit light they were worried I would get pushed over in some kind of anti-nuclear protest situation. They kept my application open and said I could go away and try and put some weight on. So I brought some weights, a bench and a large pack of chicken breasts. Linda's son Mark, who was a teenager at the time, wanted to come and work out as well. So three or four times a week we would go through a rigorous training session. After six months, Mark entered Mr Universe competition and I put on four stone of pure muscle, joined the police and became Mr January in the MOD police calendar. Sadly, that didn't happen. After a few weeks, we got fed up, we sold all the equipment and I bought a pool table. Before I leave the police story, two things. One is an MOD joke. An old MOD policeman dies, he goes up to heaven. He walks up to the pearly gates. St Peter greets him. Welcome, what did you do for a living? I guarded all these various MOD bases. I was an MOD policeman. Oh great, says St Peter, watch these gates, I'm bursting for a piss. This is also another point of my life, but for fate and a couple of pound of fat my life would have been so different. I could have been stationed anywhere in the UK. In fact, it was very unlikely that I would have been offered a position within Aldermaston. So we would have been moving around as far as Scotland or any other MOD base in between. I would probably have been a policeman all my life and this podcast would have been a lot different. Something like Monday at the main gate Checking badges. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Move along. Yeah, can I stop and have a look in your boot? Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Move along. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Yes, fine. Also, a final thought. The MOD police are armed. We had a complete firing range on site for training. I remember being at the main gate once. They had a large reception area. I think I was sheltering from the rain, probably waiting for Debbie to pick me up. A policeman came in at the end of his shift. He had to empty his gun. I watched him put his six bullets in a wooden block with holes drilled in it. The bullets were polished and shiny, simply with the number of times he did this action. I found that all a bit sad, really. By the summer of 1985, Debbie's dad, Doug, had become very ill. 
We were taken in turns to sit up at night, Peter, Linda, John, Debbie and myself. I stayed up this particular Saturday night and then went off to work on Sunday overtime. After a couple of hours, I got a phone call from Deb. Just come home. I knew what this meant. I was at an age where I hadn't really had to deal with someone close to me dying. I had only known Doug a relatively short time, but he had a profound impact on me. This was my first big funeral. I've now reached the age where I could go to a funeral once a month, but I hate them. I'm sorry, but I'm not spending my last few years of life just going to funerals. I have a list of certain people I will make an exception for. But don't ask me to say, if that upsets you, hey, you'll be dead anyway. A few months after, Gay was saying she would move. She was applying for council bungalows. We knew this wasn't right for her. How could she entertain the whole family in a pokey little bungalow? So we decided to sell our house in Thatcham and move back in Gay's three-bedroom council house. We put this in motion and in a few months it all went through. We sold our house and moved to College Peace in Mortimer. After everything I had a cheque for £1,200. Now, remember Ruth, Ruth who worked in the stores with me. It was at this point that her mother-in-law was selling a BMW. Yes, you've guessed it, for £1,200. Goodbye, yellow, pampas-killing, fiesta-smashing larder. Hello, two-litre automatic, white, full-length sunroof, leather-seated BMW. Suddenly, I was stopped most days by the MOD policeman so they could search me while admiring the car. It was brilliant. Being an automatic, you dropped it down a gear and put your foot on the accelerator and it raced away. I remember one particular incident. I'd parked the car by our stores. There was about two or three hundred yards of uh, side road before you got on the main road. This particular day it snowed quite hard all day. There was a good two inches of snow. Now they were quite meticulous about clearing the snow off the main road but not so much about the little side ones. I got in the BMW to go home, start it up, put it in drive and it raced away. Normally you could just flick your foot on the accelerator and it would take the choke off. But as the car was sliding all over the place that wasn't really an option. Uh, as the same as braking. I kept the car as straight as I could and prayed that there was nothing on the main road. I zoomed out onto the road, which was thankfully clear, and got it back under control. Still, onwards and upwards with my career zest. I applied to work in A area as a health physics surveyor, basically someone who monitors and checks levels of radiation. When I was accepted, I went on a week's course. It was all talks about isotope numbers and different machines. I can't remember an awful lot about it. In fact, the most memorable thing was one of the lads on the course was called, and no word of a lie, Wayne King. What was his mum and dad thinking? He was a Crystal Palace supporter. I don't know what that's got to do with anything, but I'd never actually met one before. After I had done all my training, I was sent to look after a nuclear reactor. What? It's, it's true. There were six of us, plus the boss. I was the youngest there, and no longer a charge hand. I was on probation as a surveyor, so I was called Proby for months, until the next trainee came along. But being a Proby meant I was chaperoned for the first few weeks. The timekeeping stretched even worse because a lot of the time we had to wear full length white hazmat suits and overshoes so time had to be allowed for going in and coming out of the area which meant an even shorter working day. At this time the workers in our area were in an industrial dispute with the management. It was regarding extra payments to work in this area. I was a lot younger than anyone, everyone else I worked with and I was always trying to fit in 
and bowed to the peer pressure. The workers in the reactor refused to go on strike. But after a few weeks the dispute was settled and everyone realised that they didn't that I was the youngest and had gone along with everyone else. But a lot of the others were ostracised. But eventually we agreed to pay the money we'd earned into charity. But we had won. Maggie had sent a directive to get it sorted. She wanted her missiles ready to use. We got £30 a week extra pay. It was the first and only strike I've been involved in. But it gave me a powerful lesson. There is power in the union. All the buildings at Aldermaston were linked by an intercom. These were always tested on a Friday. Testing, testing, testing. It's Friday the 5th of September 1985. Then at one time it went testing, testing, testing. All staff at 4am GMT time a device was tested in the Nevada desert. The management thanks everyone for their cooperation and work in this endeavour. Having moved as a surveyor, I was paid a little extra money for emergency cover during lunch hours. This rarely happened, but often they had a test. Exercise, exercise, exercise. All those offering lunchtime cover, please go to building A23. At one time I was playing a football match and we had to rush off the pitch to get to this building in a certain time, otherwise we'd be taken off cover. The site also had a social club with an extensively stocked bar at very cheap prices. It had a full fo football pinch and a cricket club, as well as a fishing club where you could fish the lakes on a Sunday. I'm not sure what the fish looked like coming from Aldermaston. If it was the end of the month and I had just been paid, I would often go for a drink Friday lunchtime. I remember one particular incident, and Linda, Debbie's sister, will corroborate this. Someone was getting married. I didn't even know him that well. But half a dozen lads had taken the rest of Friday off. They were having a drink in the club before going on to more pubs and then maybe a club in Basingstoke. Anyway, I had a few pints and then I had a southern comfort. And, well, one thing led to another. Somehow they ended up phoning Linda to collect me from a local pub. I had got so drunk that they had to smuggle me off site to a pub in Tadley. They must have found my next of king details and phoned Debbie, who had no car as I had it on site. Linda came to pick me up at the Badger's Rest public house in Tadley. She came in John's pride and joy, his red XR3. John is really meticulous about his cars. Luckily, Linda had some heavy-duty plastic sheeting which she put over the back seat. I was really ill and she laid me on the back seat with a bucket. I didn't really know till I arrived back rather sheepishly on Monday, but so many people had covered for me. My boss had put in a leave form to cover for my absence. Someone had obviously got the correct phone number to phone Deb. They looked after me outside the pub until Linda saved me. I became a bit of a legend after that. I've never been able to stomach the smell of Southern Comfort since that time. A few years later, when I left AWE, my colleagues gave me a bottle of Southern Comfort. I couldn't bring myself to drink it. It stayed in the cupboard for years. I wouldn't get so drunk again until Reading got promoted a few years later. It was about this time that I got into following the Mighty Royals. In 1985, they had achieved a record of winning all the 13 games at the start of a season. Me and John went along to the 14th game to see if they could beat the all-time consecutive win record held at the time by a small London side called Tottingham Hotspurs.
I'm only going to mention football a few times in this podcast. But in the future, I may do a complete series on football. You lucky people. It would start with my first game, age nine, Maidenhead United v Walton and Hersham, FA Cup, fourth round, qualifying, 1971. Yes, I did have to look this up. Coming out after the game. Hey Daddy, why are those fans turning over that mini? Don't worry son, it's the referees. The Southern Comfort incident actually took place after I had moved within health physics. They tended to move you on after six months so that you could get experience at all the different areas within health physics. I was now in the waste management team with around 20 people. It was the biggest apartment on the base. But most of it was outside. This was a bit of a blow as we were about to have a bad winter with snow on the ground for long periods. A lot of the work in health physics is regular monitoring. The first job I was put on was air monitors. These were machines that were placed around the waste management area. They were small machines that sucked air through a paper filter. They were alarmed and these often went off, but this was mainly due to natural background radiation. One of the buildings I dealt with was a huge storage building containing 45 gallon drums. These were sealed with items that had been in A area and were thereby considered contaminated. There was talk at the time of depositing them inside some mountain in Scotland, but I suspect they're still there. I felt sad as this building was the size of a football pitch and it would have made a marvellous leisure centre for nearby Tadley who had no such facility. By this time, we had been living with Gay for over a year. It was all going well. We told her she had a home for life. She kept herself to herself, spending a lot of time in her room where she would watch TV with headphones late into the night. She was still deeply affected from losing Doug. She suffered from hair loss, which hit her confidence and her willingness to go out. Then one Saturday, she suddenly appeared downstairs all dressed up. She announced she was off to bingo in Reading. We were taken aback. Uh, do you want a lift? No, no, I'm going to catch the bus and walked out. We spent a nervous day waiting for her return. She arrived back at five and she had bought a wig and gone to bingo. The wig wasn't very good, but it gave her confidence. I said, after that she would go off twice a week to bingo at the top rank in Reading. But this reminds me of a quote from one of my favourite films. Get busy living. You get busy dying. Get busy living or get busy dying. Goddamn right. More stories of busy living in the next episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you know what to do. Like it and share it. Thank you.